Previously, Itami, an otaku, and reservist for the JSDF, saves numerous lives during an attack in Ginza, Tokyo, when a giant gate to another world appears. The government sends in the JSDF, after three months of scouting the special region. Itami leads his new team on a mission to make first contact with the locals, in order to establish peaceful relations. They fend off a flame dragon while escorting a town to safety, and take in a strange group of refugees, who then help them defend a city with the help of the Empire's princess. Now, Itami and the small ragtag group travel to Japan in an attempt to solidify peaceful relations between the worlds. The special region's inhabitants are blown away by the immense progress that Japan has made over their own empire. They are now certain they stand no chance of winning a war against them. Itami is greeted by Komakado of the PSIA, Public Safety Intelligence Agency. He seems to have done his research as he goes over all of Itami's achievements. It looks like most of them he got out of sheer dumb luck. Apparently, he is a ranger and special forces, which floors Kuribayashi. She refuses to believe Itami could achieve such accolades. Before heading to the Senate, they need to buy some clothes to fit in, and they might as well have a well-balanced meal before testifying before an unbalanced diet. When they arrive, Pina and Bozes are held back, since they aren't even supposed to be there in the first place. Instead, they head to a secret meeting with foreign affairs. During the diet hearing, Itami is questioned by a senator who is bent on painting the JSDF in a bad light. She blames the third recon for the 150 civilian casualties during the flame dragon attack. He takes the stand and shrugs it off, simply stating, it was a dragon. They didn't have the firepower necessary to deal with such a threat. Another diet member corroborates his claims. After running tests, they concluded that the dragon's scales were comparable to tungsten. Basically, it was a giant flying tank that breathed fire. It would have been nothing short of a miracle if they had been able to save everyone. Moving on, she calls Lele to the stand to address the conditions in the JSDF refugee camp, but doesn't get the answers she was hoping for. Tuka can't even speak to the events of the attack, since she was mostly unconscious. The diet member spots Rory and thinks she must be in mourning due to her black attire. She's even wearing a veil. She berates Rory and accuses them of running away and not doing their job, since there were no JSDF casualties. Rory stands up for Itami and his team. Nobody has fought off a flame dragon and lived to tell the tale. They immediately took action to save as many civilian lives as possible, 450 to be exact. The diet member is offended by Rory's condescension, thinking she's merely a little girl, until Itami steps in, and they discover she's actually 961, Tuka is 165, and Lele is merely a 15-year-old human. Lele goes on to detail the different races of the special region. Elves can't die of old age, and Rory is actually a demigod who ascends to full godhood on her thousandth birthday. During the foreign affairs meeting, Pina and Bozes are extremely confused at how willing the Japanese are to compromise. Instead of holding their people for ransom, as a show of good faith, they hand the princess a roster of 6,000 prisoners they are currently holding and allow her to choose those she wishes to free. They use a bus as a decoy and all meet up in the subway, where Komakadu meets them a few stops later believing they've successfully thwarted a suspected mole in their operation. However, Rory is uncomfortable being underground, and they get off a stop early. Komakado says to stick to the plan, just as it's announced that the tracks up ahead have been blocked. Streetside, someone tries to steal Rory's halberd, but can't carry it. Neither can Komakado, who's immediately sent to the hospital after trying to pick it up. With nowhere to go, since the hotel isn't safe, Itami decides to bring everyone to Risa's apartment. When asked who she is, nobody is prepared for his answer. Risa is his ex-wife. Itami and Tomita agree that his ex-wife's place isn't exactly the best safe house. Though they can't rule anyone out as the mole, being separated from Komakado is not ideal. Risa tells Tomita that she and Itami are still friends. Their divorce was mutual, so there's no animosity between them. The next morning, following his motto, hobbies before work, Itami decides it's time to have some fun. At least he shoehorns in a practical advantage as cover. Splitting up and sticking to public places should be the safest bet. Itami decides to head to the manga store. Pina and Bozes ask Tomita to take them to the library, and Risa suggests the rest of the women go shopping with her. Rory refuses, because she has no need for anything other than her formal attire, but her self-control isn't exactly under control. 
Tuka, Lele, and Rory get new outfits, so as not to stand out more than they already do. At the library, Pina and Boses are blown away by how much literature it contains, but they have a different type of reading material in mind, some slice of life, light reading. Itami runs into Defense Minister Kano for the first time in 20 years. He was the first one to introduce Itami to manga. Now he needs the lieutenant to conduct secret operations, purchasing manga, since the minister can't be seen buying it himself. He orders Itami to stick with the original plan and take their guests to the rendezvous. The group reconvenes. Tuka bought a compound ball, Lele some books and a laptop, Rory got new clothes, and Pina and Boses acquired some not-so-conventional art as Tomida had in mind. That night, they head to Hakone Mountain to stay at the Sun Kai Inn. The SFG has the resort under surveillance. While getting changed, Rory notices one of the operatives watching them, even at a distance of 450 meters. After the women are alone, in their respective hot springs, they wonder about Itami and Risa's marriage. They knew each other since childhood, and Itami had the means to support her while she pursued her career as a manga artist. A marriage of convenience, really. At least it was to Itami. As soon as he left for the special region, she filed for divorce. Meanwhile, the SGF is dealing with armed intruders targeting the special region's inhabitants, though they aren't quite sure why. After unmasking a few they took out, they seem to be American. The US president makes a call to Matoi, the prime minister of Japan. It's blackmail. They have enough dirt on the cabinet to stay their hand. The prime minister tells the defense minister to have his men stand down, but he doesn't agree to just hand over their guests. If he and the cabinet step down, the Americans lose their leverage. It's up to Kano now. Itami wakes up to find Rory drinking alone. Apparently, she can't sleep. There's a battle going on outside, and she needs Itami to deal with it, having a hard time holding back. Itami also has a hard time holding back. She doesn't exactly look over 900. Saved by the bell, or ring, Itami's phone goes off, interrupting Rory's advances. The Americans get too close to the inn, and Rory decimates their black ops. They're not the only ones, though. Multiple special ops teams from different countries are caught in the crossfire. It's a massacre. Good thing Rory is invincible. There isn't much time. They need to get out of the inn and vacate the area. Itami gathers everyone and tells them to grab any usable weapons. They find a van, but instead of killing the lone agent, Lele knocks him out with magic. Everyone looks to Itami for what to do and why they can't stay and fight, but he has no idea. Pina wants to know whether she'll be used as a political prisoner. There are people who know Japan will benefit the most from the peace talks with the special region. The US president is furious with Graham, the one in charge of the operation, about losing his team without capturing the targets. While stopped at a convenience store, Risa comes up with a plan. The guests from the special region will visit the Ginza Memorial, not only to pay their respects, but to have the public eye on them following the event. The following day, news breaks about the Prime Minister stepping down, and a reporter attempts to gather public opinion when she spots a large crowd forming near the Ginza Memorial. Graham stakes out the area with another agent, but they aren't the only ones after them, and there are too many people to maintain any level of secrecy. Especially after Nanami, the reporter, notices her sister, Kuribayashi, who interrupts the broadcast to reveal that their team is being pursued, and has been for two days. Komakado appears and confronts Graham, who is apparently CIA. He calls the president, who is not happy after hearing that his entire team was arrested. The Chinese government tells their men to pull out, while the Russian president is impressed with how the Japanese dealt with the situation. Back in the special region, Pina is determined to bring an end to the war, after seeing just how advanced the Japanese civilization is compared to the Empire. She and Boses plan to leave the next day, with a letter to expedite peaceful negotiations. A mysterious figure looks over the refugee settlement that has formed at Onless Hill over the past five months. While back at the capital, Pina gets ready to initiate peace talks between the Japanese ambassador and the Senate. The agreed-upon release of 15 prisoners from the Ginza incident includes the nephew of Lord Cicero, an essential figure who supports the majority of the Senate who wish for peace. Pina introduces him to the representative from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Koji Sugawara, who brought gifts from Japan, including a katana, which illustrates just how advanced they are as a nation compared to the Empire. 
Upon hearing that Japan is still at war with the Empire, the senator becomes irate until they reveal their bargaining chip, the release of his nephew. Itami, Rory, and a few of the squad members witness Tuka continue her incessant search for her dead father and discuss whether they should break the news to her or let her hold on to her last shred of hope. Itami, now alone with Rory, ruminates about her 960 years of life, thinking it's made her a bit callous regarding these types of situations. She orders another round, but he warns her to slow down on the drinking, but she claims it's too late, while leaning in and asking what he's going to do about it, flustering him. The figure from before shows up at the tavern. It turns out she's a dark elf, and upon seeing Rory so close to Itami, she accuses him of taking advantage of a child. Rory plays along now that her night with Itami is ruined. He panics and makes a run for it. She introduces herself as Yao Ha Dushi and turns to find that Rory has also vanished. She tells the tavern patrons that she's looking for the men in green, offering a reward for their help, a giant chunk of adamantium. But as soon as she mentions a flame dragon, nobody will take her up on the offer. That night, she has a nightmare about the dragon attacking her village in the Schwartz Woods. When she's woken up by two fighter jets, it only confirms her suspicions that the JSDF are the only ones capable of taking it on. Itami heads to the capital to aid in the peace talks. The Dark Elf Elders entrusted Yao to be their emissary, but there's one problem. When she finds the green men, none of them speak the local language. After beating up multiple thugs who offer to translate for her, she finds a store selling items from Japan. The clerk refuses to sell her the red book she was issued, used for translation. Two officers end up arresting her for stealing money from the thugs. They bring in Lele to translate, and she's released after the thugs admit to giving false reports. Since she seems desperate, Lele offers to ask the Japanese for help on her behalf. General Hazuma explains that the Schwartz Woods are in the Elbe Kingdom, outside of the Empire's domain. It would interrupt peace talks and spark a conflict. Lieutenant Yanagida notices Yao's devastation and mentions that Itami might be the only one crazy enough to help. Princess Pina and one of her knights, Hamilton, are waiting for Itami and the Japanese diplomat to deliver Japanese goods in the hopes of winning over more nobles to their cause. But that's not all. Itami is accosted by Pina, demanding to know if he brought the shipment of fine art, more of the manga they brought back from Japan the first time. A group of soldiers notice how upset Yao is, disagreeing with the political reasons for refusing to help her. Like Yanagida, they mention that Itami is probably her best bet. As Yao makes her way to the co-op for the night, Itami makes his way back to Almas Hill. The princess's artwork isn't merely for leisure. It's being used to relay newspaper clippings detailing all of Itami's heroics since arriving in the special region. Despite looking like peace is on its way, the year of the Empire 687 is only half over, and unbeknownst to everyone, war is on its way. Thank you for sticking until the end. Subscribe for more videos like this.